If anyone has to take over for Captain Anderson, I'm glad it's you. I'm not sure about having non-humans on our ship, though. We're all on the same team here, Presley. With all due respect, ma'am, that's what they said about Nihilus. Look how that turned out. Speak freely, Presley. I want to know if you have a problem with non-humans. It's not that, Commander. Humanity has always handled its own problems. Saren attacked one of our colonies. We should be the ones to stop him. We don't need their help. Some people think asking for help is a sign of weakness. That's just being stupid and stubborn. No matter how strong you are, allies can make you stronger. I guess so. Maybe I'm just stuck in the old ways of thinking. But don't worry, Commander. This won't be a problem. How did you end up assigned to the Normandy? I signed up with the Alliance as a navigator right out of school. Following in my grandfather's footsteps, I guess. My first posting was on the Agincourt. We were one of the first reinforcements to arrive at Elysium after the Blitz hit. <laughs> Those raiders were no match for an Alliance frigate. Of course, the only reason the colony was still standing was because of you, Commander. I can't believe you held out as long as you did. How'd you end up on the Normandy? I got my officer's commission after Elysium. Must have made an impression on the right people. Captain asked for me when he was picking his crew. Carry on, Presley. Yes, ma'am. I, I prefer gold to silver, you know, for my metal. I figured you'd recommend me for one since I, uh, pulled your boots out of the fire. If we present you with a medal, you'll end up sitting on stage listening to politicians make speeches for a couple of hours. That's a good point. They'd probably make me shave, too. I spent the last seven weeks working on this baby. No medal's worth that. So, Commander, why don't you tell me why you're really here? How's the Normandy performing? Is she everything they said she'd be? She's the best ship in the fleet. If you've got a pilot who knows how to handle her. Balance isn't what you'd expect. Takes a while to get used to that oversized drive core we got stuffed in the back, and her power can sneak up on you if you're not careful. The Normandy's probably too much ship for your average Alliance pilot, Commander. Lucky for you, I'm anything but average. I like to know my crew. Mind if I ask you a few questions? <laughs> I can see where this is going. You did a background check on me, didn't you? Well, I'll tell you the same thing I told the Captain. You want me as your pilot. I'm not good. I'm not even great. I am the best damn helmsman in the Alliance fleet. Top of my class in flight school, I earned that. All those commendations in my file, I earned every single one. Those weren't given to me as charity for my disease. I'm sorry, Joker. I didn't even know you were sick. You mean... You mean you didn't know? Oh, crap. Okay, I've got Vrolix syndrome, brittle bone disease. The bones in my legs never develop properly. They're basically hollow, too much force, and they'll shatter. Even with crutches and my leg braces, it's hard to get around. One wrong step and crack! It's very dramatic. But I've learned to manage my condition, Commander. Put the Normandy in my hands and I'll make her dance for you. Just don't ask me to get up and dance unless, you know, you like the sound of snapping shin bones. I need to know more about this Rolex syndrome if I'm putting my ship in your hands. Yeah, of course you do. It's an extremely rare condition. Nobody knows exactly what causes it. Genetic, maybe. It's treatable, but there's no cure. They classify my case as moderate to severe. I was born with over a dozen fractures, hip, thighs, ankles, my bones were already breaking in the womb. A hundred years ago, I wouldn't have survived past my first year. Lucky for me, modern medical science has turned me into a productive member of society. You're not gonna break a bone trying to fly the ship, are you? Uh, I don't fly with my feet, Commander, so I'm fine as long as I'm in this chair. I gotta be real careful when I get up to take a piss, though. I can do my job as well as anyone on the ship. Better, actually. So don't worry about it. I'm not trying to make you uncomfortable. Let's talk about something else. Whatever you want, Commander. Why does everyone call you Joker? It's a lot shorter than saying Alliance Flight Lieutenant Jeff Moreau. Plus, I love to make little children laugh. I was just thinking how much you remind me of Santa Claus. Look, I didn't pick the name. One of the instructors in flight school used to bug me about never smiling. She started calling me Joker. Hmm. And it stuck. Why didn't you ever smile? Hey, I worked my ass off in flight school, Commander. The world's not gonna hand you anything if you go around grinning like an idiot. By the end of the year, I was the best pilot in the academy. Even better than the instructors, and everybody knew it. They'd all got their asses kicked by the sickly kid with the creaky little legs. One guess who was smiling at graduation. 
I have to go. All right, see you. Yes, Commander? Is there something you need? How did you end up serving on an Alliance ship? I enlisted right out of med school. Earth always seemed boring to me. Too safe. Too secure. I figured the colonies were teeming with exotic adventure. I wanted to travel the stars, tending the wounds of tough soldiers with piercing eyes and sensitive souls. <laughs> Turns out military life isn't quite as romantic as I'd imagined. But humanity needs the Alliance if we want to keep expanding through the Traverse. And the Alliance always needs good doctors. So I stayed on to do my part. Ever think you made the wrong choice? Sometimes I think about opening a private practice back on Earth. Or maybe taking a position at one of the new med centers out in the colonies. But there's something special about working on soldiers. If I left the Alliance now, I'd feel like I was abandoning them. How well do you know the Lieutenant? I'd never worked with him before this mission, but he has an impressive service record, over a dozen special commendations. Tends to keep to himself, though. Maybe because of the headaches. It's not easy being an L2. What does that have to do with it? Well, most biotics now use the L3 implants. Lieutenant Alenko was wired with the old L2 configuration. Sometimes there are complications. What kind of complications? Severe mental disabilities, insanity, crippling physical pain. There's a long list of horrific side effects. Caden's lucky. He just gets migraines. I should go. Goodbye, Commander. Commander, are you coming to check up on me? You look much better. How are you feeling? Dr. Chakwas assures me I am going to be fine. I was impressed with her knowledge of Asari physiology. You're in good hands. Dr. Chakwas knows what she's doing. I never properly thanked you for saving me from the Geth, Commander. If you hadn't shown up, I... I'm just glad we got there in time. So am I. I know you took a chance bringing me aboard this ship. I have seen the way your crew looks at me. They do not trust me. But I am not like Benezia. I will do whatever I can to help you stop Saren. I promise. Don't worry, Liara. I trust you. I know you won't let me down. It means a lot to hear you say that, Commander. Thank you. Do you know why Benezia joined up with Saren? I don't understand it. She was always outspoken about the need for the Asari to become more involved in shaping galactic events. Maybe she thought allying herself with Saren would somehow be for the greater good in the long run. At least I hope so. This hurts you, doesn't it? None of this makes any sense to me. I have not spoken to Benezia in many years, but I know her, and this was not like her. Something changed. I'd like to know more about the Asari. We were the first species to discover the Citadel. We were instrumental in forming the Council, and we always strive to be the voice of peaceful cooperation in galactic disputes. My people believe we are all part of a single galactic community. Each species contributes something to the greater whole. Although we seek to understand other species, it seems few of them seek to understand us. The galaxy is filled with rumors and misinformation about my people. Like what? Most of the inaccuracies are centered around our mating rituals. My species is monogendered. Male and female have no real meaning for us. We still require a partner to reproduce. This second parent, however, may be of any species and any gender. I don't understand. Your species can mate with anyone? Mating is not quite the proper term, not as you understand it. Physical contact may or may not be involved, but it is not an essential element of the Union. The true connection is mental. Our physiology allows us to meld with other beings. We can touch the very depths of their minds. We explore the genetic memory of their species. We share the most basic elements of their individual and racial identities. We then pass these traits onto our daughters. 
It is how we learn to grow as a species and how we develop a greater understanding of other races. What happens to your partner after the Union? Every relationship is different. Some unions are a single encounter with both parents parting ways afterwards. Others can be more long term. Sometimes an Asari and her partner will stay together for many decades. Do you know who Matriarch Benezia chose as her partner? She rarely spoke of her partner. Though I know my father, if you want to use that term, was another Asari. I thought you always needed another species to serve as one of the parents. Think about it, Shepard. If we were not able to mate with our own species, we would have died out long before we ever mastered spaceflight and left our homeworld. Union with our own kind is no longer common, not for the purposes of reproduction. Most Asari believe it weakens our species. Asari daughters inherit racial traits from the father species. If both parents are Asari, then nothing has been gained, or so conventional wisdom would hold. I am what is sometimes called a pure blood. Though no Asari would ever be cruel enough to say the word to my face, it is a great insult among my people. It is possible Benezia's partner was embarrassed by their union. She may have been too ashamed to publicly acknowledge me as her offspring. Maybe she wanted to meet you but couldn't. Maybe something could have happened to her. Maybe she passed away. You might be right. I hope you are. But I have no way to know for sure. Benezia never spoke of her partner. Whatever happened, it caused her too much pain to dwell on it. She raised me by herself, though that is not uncommon. Many Asari raise their children alone, particularly if the father species is short-lived. Often the partner will pass on long before the child reaches maturity. You Asari live for a thousand years. What happens when your partner dies? Few sapient species live as long as my kind. We have learned to take a philosophical approach to our unions. We do not focus on the inevitable loss of our partners. Instead, we enjoy the time we spend with them. And even after they're gone, a part of them lives on in us. The Union is a connection that transcends both time and space. I should go. Goodbye, Commander. make time for my officers. Off the record, I think there's something wrong here. This Saren is looking for records on some kind of galactic extinction, but we can't get back up from the council? Sorry, Commander. There's writing on the wall here, but someone isn't reading it. The council doesn't want to believe anything's wrong. I'd call it human nature, but... I hear you. It, it just seems like a group that's been around as long as the council should see this coming. I mean, it's funny, we finally get out here the final frontier was already settled, and the residents don't even seem impressed by the view, or the dangers. Well, well, you're a romantic. Did you sign on for the dream, Alenko? Secure a man's future in space? <laughs> yeah, I, re I read a lot of those books when I was a kid, where the hero goes to space to prove himself worthy of a woman he loves, or, you know, for justice. Now, maybe I was a romantic in the beginning, but I thought about it after brain camp. Uh, sorry. Biotic acclimation and temperance training. I'm not looking for the dream. I just want to do some good. See what's out here. Sorry if I got too informal. Protocol wasn't a big focus back in Bot. Tell me about it. Biotic acclimation and temperance didn't last past the airlock. To the kids they hauled in, it was brain camp. Sorry, hauled in is unkind. We were encourage to commit to an evaluation of our abilities so an understanding of biotics could be compiled. There are worse results of accidental exposure to element zero in the womb. Beats the brain tumors some kids grew up with. Is there some question about how you were exposed? My mother was downwind of a transport crash. It was before there were human biotics, a little after the discovery of the Martian ruins. It only gets iffy around 63 when Kinetics was running out of first-gen subjects. Until then, they'd relied on accidentals. Bunch of guys.
guys in suits show up at your door after school, and next thing you know, you're out on Jump Zero. Jump Zero is Gagarin Station, right? What's it like? Yeah, that's the official name. Biggest and farthest facility we had for decades. Right on the termination shock, the outer edge of the solar system. It's where they did all the goose chase FTL research before we caught on to using mass effect fields. It was a sterile research platform when I was there. There were other kids in the same boat, right? At least you weren't alone out there. That's true. We did have a little circle that'd get together every night before lights out. We didn't have much to do, though. It was a research platform then, and Kinetics kept Jump Zero off the extranet to prevent leaks. Then you must have had plenty of time to get to know each other. Yeah. We'd sit around and bowl every night after dinner, play cards or network games. There was this girl named Rana who had a little circle grow up around her. She was from Turkey. Her family was very rich. But she was smart and charming as hell. Beautiful, but not stuck up about it. Like you, I guess. Ma'am. Sounds like she was special to you. She was. Maybe she felt the same, but things never felt together. Training, you know. You know of any intentional exposures for certain? No one knows. Doesn't mean they didn't happen. As big as the exposures were, it was hard to track down accidentals. It was different then. No one knew the potential, so there wasn't a lot of regulation. Anything Kinetics did was gold. I'm not saying they intentionally detonated drives over our outposts, but in retrospect, they were damn quick on the scene. Jump Zero's a long way from home. What was it like? The grand gateway to humanity looks a lot better in the vids. Anyway, this was supposed to be a casual debrief, not a bull session about stuff that happened years ago. We have to depend on each other in combat. I like knowing what kind of man I have at my back. I understand, ma'am. I won't let you down. You, uh, make a habit of getting this personal with everyone? Of course. But I don't enjoy it with everyone. We'll talk again later. I'll, uh, I'll need some time to process that, Commander. But, yeah, I'd like that. Hey, Commander. Looking for some extra supplies before you head out? What have you got? Whatever you want. Armor, weapons, mods. It's not standard Alliance issue, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Well, as long as you don't mind paying for it. Why should I pay you for my weapons and armor? My stuff doesn't come from the Alliance. I have to purchase it myself, and it's not cheap. Hell, the licenses alone have set me back more than I'd like. But no licenses? No goods. Without the goods, I'm out of a job. What are licenses? Why do you need them? Manufacturers sell licenses. Each license allows me to buy and sell a certain brand of products. I already have several basic ones, but you'll need to buy more if you want me to bring in different brands. Many of the best licenses are hard to get, but they're well worth the cost if you can find them. What do the different manufacturers offer? There are too many for me to keep track of. But each license will explain what it's good for. How often will you get new items? Well, that depends on how many licenses you've purchased. But I'll rotate items on a regular basis regardless. And any time we land someplace with a big enough port, I'll buy, sell, and trade whatever I can. Check back often. I need to move items quickly, so only the most basic items will be stocked consistently. Not right now, thanks. No problem. Keep checking back. Commander, nice work out there. I knew working with the Spectre would be better than life at CSAC. Have you worked with the Spectre before? Well, no, but I know what they're like. Spectres make their own rules. You're free to handle things your way. At CSAC, you're buried by rules. The damn bureaucrats are always on your back. For the most part, the rules are there for a reason. Maybe. 
But sometimes it feels like the rules are only there to stop me from doing my work. If I'm trying to take down a suspect, it shouldn't matter how I do it, as long as I do it. But CSEC wants it done their way. Protocol and procedure come first. That's why I left. So you just quit because you didn't like the way they do things? There's more to it than that. It didn't start out bad, but as I rose in ranks, I got saddled with more and more red tape. CSEC's handling of Saren was typical. I just couldn't take it anymore. I hate leaving. I hope you made the right choice. I'd hate for you to regret it later. Well, that's sort of why I teamed up with you. It's a chance for me to get off the Citadel, see how things are done outside CSEC. Either way, I plan to make the most of this. And without CSEC headquarters looking over my shoulder, well, maybe I can get the job done my way for a change. If getting the job done means endangering innocent people, then no. We get the job done right, not fast. Got it? I wasn't trying to. I understand, Commander. Commander? What's your opinion of the last mission? Not sure I buy Dr. Tassoni's story about her and her mom not talking. They're family, right? I think she's being straight with us. Or at least I don't think she lies very often. Yeah, she's probably really bad at it. Too bad those ruins got destroyed. I mean, they lasted thousands of years. That's impressive. Do you have a few minutes to talk? One on one? Sure. I, I was hoping to get a minute of your time off the record. I keep an open door policy. If you have any concerns, lay them on me. All right. I, I know things are different aboard the Normandy, but uh, I'm I'm concerned about the aliens, Vicarian and Rex. With all due respect, Commander, should they have full access to the ship? They may not serve the Alliance Chief, but they're allies, at least as far as Saren goes. This is the most advanced ship in the Alliance Navy. I don't think we should give them free reign to poke around the vital systems. Engines, sensors, weapons... You don't trust the Alliance's allies? I'm not sure I'd call the Council races allies. We... humanity, I mean, have to learn to rely on ourselves. Standing up for ourselves doesn't mean standing alone. I don't think we should turn down allies. I just think we shouldn't bet everything on them staying allies. As noble as the council members seem now, if their backs are against the wall, they'll abandon us. I don't see that as inevitable. Look, if you're fighting a bear, and the only way for you to survive is to sick your dog on it and run, you'll do it. As much as you love your dog, it isn't human. It's not racism, not really. Members of their species will always be more important to them than humans are. These seem like deeply held beliefs, Williams. What made you think this way? My family's defended the Alliance since it was founded. My father, grandfather, great-grandmother, they all picked up a rifle and swore the oath of service. I guess we just tend to think of Earth's interests as our own. And I come from a military family, too. My parents were both Navy. Anybody in your family we might know? Couldn't say, Commander. We probably have a lot in common. You join up to carry on the tradition? No. The future of humanity is out here. There's so much we haven't seen yet. Yeah. I still remember my first field exercise on Titan. When we hit mud, the reality hit me. I'm the first person who ever stood here. Then my drill instructor kicked me in the ass. I went face first into the muck. He spent the next five minutes chewing me out for gold breaking. Don't tell me you had Gunny Ellison. <laughs> He's the only one who uses that word to describe shirking duty. Oh, Lord. You went to the Makapag boot camp, too? Yeah. Gunny Ellison's still reaming out recruits down there. Kicking ass and using words like inveigle and pusillanimous. <laughs> it doesn't sound like you've worked with aliens before. No, ma'am. Mainly I've been groundside, part of the surface garrison forces. I did get a rotation on a space station for training. Every Marine a rifleman, every rifleman ZG certified. That's odd. Your record is spotless and your technical scores are exemplary. You should be serving with the fleet. Anyway, that's why I haven't served with many aliens, Commander. All right, I can see where your concerns are coming from, Williams. But this is a multilateral mission. You're gonna have to work with aliens, like it or not. It won't be a problem, Commander. You say jump, I say how high. You tell me to kiss a Turian, I'll ask which cheek. I don't think kissing Turians will be necessary. You never know, Commander. 
dismissed, Chief. Ma'am. Shepard, what can I do for you? What's your story, Rex? There's no story. Go ask the Quarian if you want stories. You Krogans live for centuries. Don't tell me you haven't had a few interesting adventures. Well, there was this one time the Turians almost wiped out our entire race. That was fun. Yeah, they tried the same with us, but we fought them off. It's not the same. It seems pretty much the same to me. So your people were infected with a genetic mutation? An infection that makes only a few in a thousand children survive birth? And I suppose it's destroying your entire species? I suppose it isn't all the same. I don't expect you to understand, but don't compare humanity's fate with the Krogan. I was just making conversation. I wasn't trying to upset you. Your ignorance doesn't upset me, Shepard. As for the Krogan, I gave up on them long ago. The genophage infected us, but it's not what's killing us. What can you tell me about the genophage? Ask the Salarians if you want details. They made it. All I know, it makes breeding nearly impossible. Thousands die in stillbirth, and most never get that far. Every Krogan is infected, every one. And no one's rushing to find a cure. Why don't the Krogan try to find a cure? When was the last time you saw a Krogan scientist? You ask a Krogan, would he rather find a cure for the genophage or fight for credits? He'll choose fighting every time. It's just who we are, Shepard. I can't change that. Nobody can. Are your people really dying? We're sure not getting any stronger. We're too spread out. None of us are interested in staying in our own system. Lots of species have left their homes and prospered. But they go to colonize new worlds. We're not settlers. We're warriors. We want to fight. So we leave. Hire ourselves out. And most of us never go back. So long, Rex. Shepard. Hey, Commander, you know that Quarian Tally? She's been spending all her time down here asking me about our engines. I'll tell her to leave you alone. What? No, she's amazing. I wish my guys were half as smart as she is. Give her a month on board and she'll know more about our engines than I do. She's got a real knack for technology, that one. I can see why you wanted her to come along. I figured she'd be a real asset to the team. You got an eye for talent, Commander. But I'm guessing that's not why you came down here. Fill me in on the IES stealth system. How does it work exactly? You can't hide a ship out in space. They emit too much heat and radiation. Too easy for sensors to pick them up. Unless you find a way to capture those emissions. So our stealth systems trap the energy we give off in storage sinks built into the ship itself. No emissions to give away our location. Eventually the sinks have to be vented. More than a few hours silent running and they overheat. Cook us inside our own hull. There's no way for anyone to detect us? A visual scan can still pick us up. Anyone looking out a window can see us plain as day. But you have to be pretty close to get an actual visual out in space. Most vessels rely on scanners. As long as the stealth systems are engaged, they can't see us. Not unless we accelerate to FTL speeds. Why doesn't it work with faster-than-light travel? Cranking up the FTL blue shifts our emissions, pushes them into frequencies too high to capture in the sinks. As soon as we make the jump, it's like setting off a flare. Sensors can pick up our location whenever we enter or exit FTL flight, but for short-range missions, our stealth systems are amazing, and we've got the only one. I want to know more about the Normandy. She's the best ship I've ever served on. Probably the fastest vessel ever designed. And she's the only one using the new Tantalus Drive Corps. What's so special about the Tantalus Drive Corps? Proportionally, 
It's about twice the size of any other vessel. Not only are we faster, but we can run at FTL speeds longer before we have to discharge the core. Where else have you served, Adams? You name a class of Alliance ship, I've probably served on it. Everything from dreadnoughts and carriers right down to frigates like the Normandy. My last assignment was on the Tokyo. Only a cruiser, but she was a good ship. Couldn't hold a candle to the Normandy, though. Carry on, Adams. Aye, aye, Commander. Your ship's amazing, Shepard. I've never seen a drive core like this before. I can't believe you were able to fit it into a ship this small. I'm starting to understand why you humans have been so successful. I had no idea Alliance vessels were so advanced. The Normandy's a prototype, cutting edge technology. A month ago, I was patching a makeshift fuel line into a converted tug ship in the flotilla. Now, I'm sitting on board one of the most advanced vessels in Citadel space. I have to thank you again for bringing me along. Traveling on a vessel like this is a dream come true for me. I had no idea you found ship technology so interesting. It comes with being a Quarian. The migrant fleet is the key to the survival of my people. Ships are our most valuable resource. But we don't have anything like this. We make do with cast-offs and second-hand equipment. We just try to keep them running for as long as we can. Some of the fleet's larger vessels date all the way back to our original flight from the Get. I can't believe your fleet's still using ships that are three centuries old. They're constantly being repaired, modified, and refitted. They aren't pretty, but they work. Mostly. We've tried to make ourselves as independent as possible on the flotilla. Grow our own food, mine, and process our own fuel. But some things we just can't make on our own. A patch to maintain the hull integrity requires raw materials we just don't have. That's why our pilgrimages are so important. I want to know more about the pilgrimage. When my people reach maturity, we leave our birth ships and seek acceptance with a new crew. It's necessary to maintain genetic diversity among the fleet. But no ship wants to accept someone who will be a burden on them. So, to prove our worth, we embark on a pilgrimage. We set out alone, leaving the flotilla and our families behind us. We only return once we have found something of value we can bring back to the fleet. This is presented as a gift to the captain of the respective ship we wish to join. If the gift is accepted, we are welcomed into the crew. Can a captain choose to reject the gift? That doesn't happen often. Most captains are eager to increase the size of their crew. It increases their own standing in our society. Even when a gift is not particularly valuable, the captain usually accepts it out of a sense of tradition. However, there is a stigma to presenting a substandard gift. It's not the best way to make a good impression on a new community. Most pilgrims don't return until they find something worthwhile. I want to talk about something else. Like what? Tell me about your people. Our lives aren't easy. Resources are scarce, and we are constantly on the move. Everything we do must in some way contribute to the continuation of the migrant fleet. There are 17 million Quarians in the flotilla, and each of us relies on the others for survival. The bonds among my people are strong. Unfortunately, we have had to surrender many of the freedoms and civil liberties other species take for granted. What kind of freedoms? Well, it's illegal for parents to have more than one child. If our population grows too much, it would strain our resources to their breaking point. Of course, we also can't allow our numbers to become too few. If our population is in decline, the rule against single births is temporarily repealed. In extreme cases of population decline, incentives are even offered to encourage multiple births. Though the Conclave hasn't had to take such measures in nearly a century. That's your government. The Conclave is our civilian branch of government. Each ship can elect a representative to serve on the Conclave and make decisions that affect the fleet as a whole. On matters that affect an individual ship, however, the captain has the final say. It's a tradition that dates back to the early days, when the fleet was governed by martial law. 
Fortunately, most captains nowadays are smart enough to have an elected council from their crew to give them advice and guidance. So the ultimate power rests with elected officials? In practice, the Conclave and the respective council for each ship tend to set the rules that govern our daily lives. But in theory, we are still under military jurisdiction. The five top-ranking military officials in the fleet serve on the Admiralty Board. These five have the power to overrule any decision by the Conclave in case of emergency. To do so requires unanimous agreement among the Admiralty. And they can only do this once. After that, the entire board must resign their posts. It's a safeguard that served us well. In nearly three centuries, the Admiralty Board has only overruled the Conclave four times. I want to know more about the Geth. I doubt I can tell you anything you don't already know. It's been almost three centuries since they drove my people into exile. All I know is the story of their origins. What they were when we created them, and how they turned on us. Interesting. The Geth were originally created to serve as an automated manual labor force. Initially, their intelligence was as limited as any VI. Over time, we made small modifications to their programming to allow them to perform more varied and complex tasks, bringing them closer and closer to true AI status. How come the Council didn't step in and stop you? This wasn't true AI research. We may have been skirting the bounds of the law, but we never did anything that was actually illegal. The changes were so insignificant, so gradual, that we were able to control them. Or so we thought. But one thing we underestimated was the power of the neural network. A million Geth thinking simultaneously created an inherently unstable matrix. So the Geth share brain power? Many of the Geth's logic systems were designed to work in concert with other nearby Geth. Basically, the more of them you have in the group, the smarter they are. So there's some sort of group consciousness? No, nothing like that. They cannot share sensory data or information. Their programming cannot handle that much simultaneous input. Each Geth maintains an individual awareness and identity. The neural network only operates on a process-based level. It's basically the synthetic equivalent of a subconscious. But, when they're in close proximity, they can coordinate low-level functional processes, freeing up more capacity for original or independent thought. That doesn't make any sense. I'm probably oversimplifying. The Geth are incredibly advanced and complex creations. All you need to know is that they get smarter when they gather in large numbers. As we built more and more Geth, their effective intelligence became more sophisticated, more abstract. One day, a Geth began to ask its Quarian overseer questions about the nature of its existence. Am I alive? Why am I here? What is my purpose? As you can imagine, this caused a near panic among my people. I don't see what's so bad about those questions. The Geth were created to engage in mundane, repetitive, or dangerous manual labor. That's fine for machines, but it won't satisfy a sentient being for long. The Geth were showing signs of rudimentary self-awareness and independent thought. If the Geth were intelligent, then we were essentially using them as slaves. It was inevitable the newly sentient Geth would rebel against their situation. We knew they would rise up against us. So we acted first. A general order went out across all Quarian-controlled systems to permanently deactivate all Geth. The Geth responded to this order violently. Hey, you can't blame them for fighting for their survival. We had no other choice. The Geth were already on the verge of revolution. By acting quickly, we had a chance to end the war before it began. The hope was that most of the Geth would still be little more than machines, incapable of organized resistance. But they had progressed much further than anyone anticipated. The war was long and bloody. Millions upon millions of Quarians died at their hands. In the end, we were forced to flee our own homeworld. We feared the Geth would pursue us, but they never came beyond the Veil. Now, we drift through space, 
exile searching for a way to reclaim what was once ours. It's hard to feel sorry for you. Your ancestors tried to wipe out another species. We made a mistake when we created the Geth in the first place. But we did not make a mistake when we went to war against them. If we had not acted, they would have wiped us out. They're a synthetic life form. They have no use for organics. None. Why do you think they cut themselves off from the rest of the galaxy? Why do you think they've killed every organic being who's ever tried to contact them? They didn't kill Saren. What does that tell you? The Geth are not innocent victims in all this. They're the enemy. They want to destroy us. Not just the Quarians. All organic life. That's why they've joined up with Saren. And that's why we have to stop him. I should go. See you later. <laughs>